video than normal, right? That was only like 30 seconds long. No, no, no. Done. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. I hope that you guys had a wonderful Christmas. I know that for my family, we had an awesome Christmas. My parents are in town, so we got to have the opportunity to celebrate that with them. And uh, we, uh, my mom was like, I'll make ham and my favorite thing ever, which is like a twice-baked potato casserole thing, which involves basically the entire block of cream cheese. So that's the reason why it's really good, you know. And then butter, because as we all know, butter makes everything better, right? So you know, we had a lot of fun yesterday just getting to do all that and celebrate that with the kids. And, you know, a few tears from the kids because I want what she has type of situation. You know how that goes as a parent, right? But we had a blast. And so as we were getting to spend that time with the family, you know, I also had the opportunity to get to step back and just study about what it is that I feel like God has put on me to be able to share with you guys and to be able to help us take our next step into what next year is going to look like. And so I'm really excited about what's going to happen. So will you all pray with me as we are going to get into God's word? God, thank you so much for each person in here. Lord, I pray that as we had just received our tithes and our offerings, Lord, that we will be able to just dig into your word, just listen to what it is that you have for us. Lord, we are so thankful that, you know, even though today is the day after Christmas, that we're still able to come together as a church body and we're able to celebrate you. Lord, we love you and we thank you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I have a question for you. You ready? Ooh, I like when you guys respond. Okay, so has there ever been a time whenever you felt like the world was just messed up? Mm -hmm. I knew you were all going to respond that way, and I'm glad you did. There's been times whenever we realize the world is just messed up, and I would probably say over the past two years, right, we've been sitting here thinking, oh, yeah, the world is messed up. 100% the world is messed up. And what we've seen is that people struggle with one another. You don't agree with me, I don't agree with you, so I don't like you. What? Right? We see that over the past couple of years, because of differences in opinions, because of differences in the way we view things and the way we do things, we feel like the world is just completely and totally messed up. And the thing is, the world is completely and totally messed up. And what's even crazier is whenever we look at what's happened over the past couple of years, we see that people are arguing over the silliest things, right? We see videos of people arguing on airplanes. We see videos of people in the grocery stores getting into fights over the silliest little things. We see videos of people just fighting in general. It's basically like we're all back at kindergarten. We're fighting over the fact that he or she has my toy. And it's silly. Because we stand here as adults and we think the world is messed up. What's going on? What's going to happen next? And in 2020, we thought, well, 2021 is going to be better. Thank you, Jesus. And what we noticed was that some things were better, some things weren't better. And we're standing here at the end of 2021 now saying, Lord, I only hope 2022 is going to be better. Right? And so we wonder, what's going to happen next? But what I've also done is I've taken a look at what's happened in history because I truly love to watch history videos and documentaries and stuff like that. Stacy can't stand it when I'm doing that. She basically goes to the other room and turns on Hallmark Channel, okay? (laughs) But I love to watch documentaries and I love to read about history because if we don't learn from history, oftentimes history is going to repeat itself, right? And so what I learned by looking back at history was there's been many different times where we thought, okay, if we just do this, we'll fix what's taking place in the world. And what we discovered was that there's a couple different times. There was a moment of the age revolution where we thought if we just get rid of the monarch and we have a democracy, it's going to fix everything. And then we also had the time where it was the age of enlightenment. If we just educate our people, the world's going to become better. 
and then there's science. If we just bring more technology and science into the world, people are going to have more fulfilled lives, and it's going to be more enjoyable, and, you know, the list goes on. But whenever we think about those different things, when we look at these three different ages, we realize that the world's still messed up. That didn't change it. And what we discover is that whenever we look at, for example, the age of revolution, we see that even though, you know, there's democracies and all that kind of stuff, people are still oppressed. That didn't change. We also see that in the age of enlightenment, it allowed for smart or for people to become more educated so that the crazy people are even crazier and smarter in the way they do it. Well, that didn't fix it. And then we see with science that, well, the atomic bomb. There's cybercrime. There's now social media where people feel like their voices are louder and they can tear people down as quick as they can type. And even though these things aren't bad things like the age revolution and science and the age of enlightenment, those aren't bad things, but they didn't fix the problem that we have in our world. They didn't change the outcome of what they thought was going to happen. They did make our lives a little better in some ways, but they didn't fix it. And what we've discovered is that through all of this, there's sin in the world. And whenever we take a look at that big picture, which is what I just talked about, let's take a look at more of the personal side of things. Because what we'll see is that whenever we break it down and we look just at our own selves, there's issues that we maybe have individually. And maybe for us, whenever we look at this and we look at the brokenness that's taking place in the world, we have this void that we like to fill. And oftentimes we like to fill that void with things like money and power and relationships and stuff. You fill in the blank. We like to feel all of that, and we like to put all this onto our plate, thinking, well, if I just add this, it's going to be better. Well, if I just add this, it's going to be better. Well, if I just add this, it's going to be better. And we realize that we're adding all this on our plate, and then we have this anxiety of the world because everything's on our shoulders whenever we did that to ourselves. We thought this was going to fix it, but it only made it more difficult. And life becomes crazy and hectic and we sit here and we think this world is insane what's happening what do i do next how do i get out of this and as people in this room maybe you're a business person and maybe you have this temper with your kids and you don't know how to fix it you don't know how to hold back this anger and frustration or maybe you're someone who continues to look at things like social media and you look at the way other people do things and you just wish that your life was that way. Why can my, not, my wife not be like that? Why can my home not look like that? And we start to judge ourselves and put ourselves down and we allow this sin to enter into our lives. And we allow for ourselves to become judgmental on others because of what we see. So who's a part of the problem? We all are a part of the problem. But what do we do about it? What can we do to fix it? And I want to take a look at that today, but before we take a look at how we can fix it, I want to look at the similarities of what we see today with what was taking place back then. Because like I said, I love history. So whenever you look back at it and we can learn from it, then we know not to repeat it, right? So let's go on ahead, and I'm going to ask for you guys to open up your Bibles to Romans chapter 1. 
And as you open up your Bibles to Romans chapter 1, I want us to understand that sin has taken over our thoughts, emotions, and actions. And we'll see that that happens also in Scripture as well. Sin has taken over our thoughts. Sin has taken over our emotions. And sin has taken over our actions and everything that we do every single day. So what are we going to do about it? Well, like I said, we're going to look at Romans chapter 1, verse 21. And just by starting off, Romans chapter 1, verse 21, what we'll see is it says, For although they knew God. So we're not even half into the first verse, and I want to stop right there. Because what it's saying is, for although they knew God, what we're learning is they know about God, they know who God is, but that doesn't mean that they're going to live their life for God. What we're seeing here is that they know and they've heard about God, but they just don't care. They don't care at all. And so as we continue looking at Scripture, then it says, continuing in verse 21, they did not honor him as God or gave thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. So what exactly this is saying here is that these people were narcissistic. These people only wanted to focus on what can benefit themselves, and what they did was through their thoughts and their notions and their imagination and their speculations about God, they chose to just not listen to what it is that God has for them. They chose to say, I know who you are, but I don't care. I know you want me to do this, but I don't care. I know that you've asked for me to move this way and go this way and do these things and live my life this way, but I don't care. Yeah, I know who God is, but I don't care. Does that sound like the world today? It's not fun to hear that, but that's what's happened in the past, and that's still what's happening today. But then as we continue reading, in verse 22, it then says, Claiming to be wise, they became fools, and exchanging the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal men and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. Here's what I want you guys to do. Where it says God gave them up, I want you to underline that. Because what we're going to see is in what we're reading today, this happens three times where it says God gave them up. In three different areas, we'll see that God gave them up. And this phrase is very important because what we understand is that God is saying, listen, I'm telling you how to live your life. I've shown you how to live your life. You know what to do, and you're choosing not to, so I'm going to give you up so that you can live your life the way you think it's best. And I'm telling you it's not best. I'm telling you it's going to make your life miserable. I'm telling you you're going to add all these things into your life and it's not going to change a thing. So I'm giving you up. It is what it is. Sorry. You should have listened. It's kind of like how whenever we look at our kids and we say, don't do this, and they still do it and they get hurt, and it's like, I'm going to hold you because you're crying, but I told you. Did I not tell you? Because whenever I'm telling you no, it's to protect you. Whenever I'm telling you no, it's that you don't get hurt, and then you're even worse than you already are. And they still do it. And it's like, I tried to keep you safe, but you didn't listen. And what's happening here is that they know, but they just don't care. Because what's happening is their lives are becoming corrupt. They're becoming corrupt humans. And they're choosing to live the life the way they want to live. And life becomes much, much worse. And what we also see here is that Paul echoes this language from the Old Testament. And it's actually really important for us to know this. Because we've been looking at the Old Testament, right, over a while now. And what we've learned through looking at the Old Testament is that these people make 
unhealthy, unwise decisions, right? They, you know, they have the pillars and they are following God and all these miracles happen. And then literally days later, they're like grumbling and upset and mad of what's going on. I can't believe God would do this to us. And what we learn is that they create this golden calf. They create this idol. And what's happening is they're making these idols, and whenever we take a look at the Old Testament, Paul is trying to help us understand that, listen, I'm not just speaking to the Gentiles here. We see this also in the Old Testament. He uses the exact same verbiage. And whenever he's saying that, he's also telling these people that it's not just the Gentiles, but it's also the Jews. So in theory, everyone's messed up. That's what he's trying to explain to us in these verses. Everyone's messed up. Everyone's struggling. We can't do it on our own. And whenever you try to do it on your own, guess what? Life becomes more difficult. And you know, God gave them up. You see, as Paul is telling us in verse 24 about these ever-increasing cycles of sin, he's also specifically highlighting a, a sin of inappropriateness, of sexual sin. And as we take a look at that, and as we see that he's highlighting this, it's keeping this widespread Jewish tradition of, of what's going on and how they're doing things and how they're controlling things and how they are living their lives. And what it's doing is it's showing us how sin of idolatry and sin of disruption, what it does is it separates us from God, and what we see is it makes this interaction and our relationships even more unhealthy. And it makes it to where we don't know what to do next. We're doing all these inappropriate things, so then how do I turn around and fix it? What do I do next? I'm involved in all this mess. And then what we see in verse 25 is that he then takes a look and says, because these exchanges exchange the truth about God for a lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So what this is saying is that they start to lose sight of the creator and they're worried more about their own, you know, false gods they're creating, their own selfish desires that they've created. And instead of understanding who the creator actually is, what do they do? They make their own. And because of that, for this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. Again, God gave them up. Second time now. Living their life the way they think they should, not listening, not being obedient. And God gave them up. We've already read at the beginning that they know who God is, but they don't care. They just don't care. God gave them up. And we just talked about what specifically God gave them up means, but then what we see next in verse 25 is where these the scripture and he continues to talk about what's taking place and we understand and as we read verse 27 we see that what's happening is that men and women are leaving those so they're leaving their spouses and men are going to do inappropriate things with other men women are leaving their spouses to go do inappropriate things with other women and they're just choosing to live their life in this sinful way and what we see in verse 27 is that these people are just saying, God's desires are not my desire. I'm not desiring what God's desire is for me. So I am just going to choose to live my life the way I want to. And so Paul finally introduces to us the hanging over portion of what happens in verse 27. Paul finally tells us, like, okay, listen, here's the final thing. Here's the action of what's going to happen because you are choosing to live your life the way you want to live your life. And he says in verse 28, And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God the third time, God gave them up 
to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. Three times. Three times God has given them up. Three times these pe- God's given them chances. We see this throughout all of Scripture, y'all. Whenever we looked at the Old Testament and we were going through everything that was happening in Exodus, we saw many times where he said, okay, I'll give you one day, right? And they didn't listen. And so because they didn't listen, what happened? All of these plagues took place. And God's like, well, you know, I tried. And we see it even here in the New Testament. Thousands of years later, they're still struggling with all these things, and they're still choosing to do what they want to do, and they don't want to listen to the Creator. So God gave them up. God says, I tried, guys. Like, I'm giving you what you need. Just, just look up to me. Trust me. Follow me. And they choose to not listen. Three times. And really the reason why is because of the original fall of man. At the very beginning, whenever sin entered the world, what do we want to do? We want to do what we think is going to make us feel good. We want to do what we think is going to be beneficial for us. We want to do what we think is going to be fun and exciting and thrilling. But is that what God wants us to do? And as humans, we choose so often to just fall back into these things, these sins, because they were easy, they were fun, they were exciting Life wasn't better. Life still isn't better whenever we live our life that way. And for that reason, God chose to give them up. But then, in verses 29 through 31, we see something very important. Because what we'll see is that there's this list of all these things that people are doing. And what I want you guys to do is take a look at this list and see if this list matches up with what's happening today in our world. Because it's going to be pretty shocking. You ready? Thanks, Mike. (laughs) Verse 29. They were filled with all manner of unrighteous evil, covetous, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanders, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, Inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, Hmm. foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless, though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. That's pretty crazy to read, huh? You see, what's taking place is this new life, uh, well, what's taking place, what we see, is that there's three different ways that you can take a look at this. There's three different sections of this. And whenever we look at this, it actually will make more sense whenever I break it down in these three different sections. The first section says they have become filled with envy, with, with every kind of wicked, evil, greed, and depravity. The second section is they are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. And the third section is they are gossip, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey parents. Again, hmm. They are senseless, faithless, heartless, and ruthless. So whenever we look at that and we break it down, it's actually kind of logical how he broke it down. Because what we're going to see is that as it's broken down, the first sentence contains the list of general terms. So this first section is general terms. Then we see, (coughs) excuse me, the second section. And the second section is focusing on uh, basic sins. And then the third section is this, this mixture, this big pot of all these different things that we do. And he's breaking it down 
for us to be able to understand that, hey, listen, these big sins that we think are completely wrong, those are not the only problem. There's other things as well that we do that are just as bad. There's other things that we do in our world that we still need to fix. And it's insane because as we read it, I'm going to go back to show you again. As we read it, and we look at this last part, they give approval to those who practice them. Is that not crazy to read? They're giving approval of sin. It's like, I'm going to sin. Yay, you sinned today. Good job. You're going to get a gold star because you sinned. What? Do you not hear how ridiculous that sounds? That's stupid. I'm going to give approval to this practice. Woohoo! Let's literally sit here for a second and think about that. What in the world is happening? And today... Today, y'all, doesn't TV give approval to all the mess that's wrong? Don't these different things that happen on life and, and these people that are supposed to be, you know, we're supposed to follow, they're giving approval to stuff that you're like, hello, 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 look at the Bible. What is happening? History is repeating itself, is it not? What's going on? But you know what? There is a way to fix it. And that way to fix it is Jesus Christ. That's how we can fix it, is through Jesus Christ. Now, what exactly, Tyler, does that mean? Well, you see, Jesus died on the cross Not only to bring new life after death, but to bring new life right now. New life right now. So will you all please turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. And we're going to take a look at what exactly does this mean. How is this uh, possible for for Jesus to bring this new life? How is this possible for Jesus to, to help us defeat this problem that we call sin? Great question, guys. I'm glad you asked. Here we go. You ready? Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to be looking specifically at verse 22. Ephesians 4, verse 22. It says, To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires. Will you guys circle put off for me? That's very important. Put off. Well, Whenever I was researching about this, kind of looking more into what this specific verse is talking about, I learned from this guy named John Butler something very important. He gives us three different things to think about. And so he gives us, one, the the conduct to put off, two, the creature to put off, and then three, the corruption to put off. Now, Tyler, what does that mean? I'm glad you asked what that means. I'm going to explain it. Here we go. You ready? Good. Thanks, Mike. Okay, so here we go. To the conduct to put off is the translation spoken of one's entire conduct. Every area of one's conduct of the past was to be terminated, put off, come to a complete stop. So the way that we once lived, the way that we once were, it's to be ended. Put off. Stop it. Don't do it again. If that means you have to cut it off, cut it off. Sorry, no more. Not going to happen. The creature to put off. This term used to represent the fleshly nature of man. This was the nature under which men were ruled until they were saved. So, I got to thinking about this. With my uh, family being in town, I remember as a child this video. And so, my dad whenever I was really little, not only did worship, but he also did student ministry. 
And I remember they came back from camp, and there was this skit. And the skit was there was a box on the floor, and this woman was in the box, and she was stuck because the box was sin. And she couldn't get out. And these people walked by and like, hey, do you want to have this? Oh, yeah. Hey, do you want to have Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But then none of that made it better. None of that fixed the ability for her to get out of the box. And as I was thinking about that, what's happened is she was a slave to sin. She was a slave to this box, and she couldn't get out of this box, and she was chained to it. And that's just like it is for our lives today, is we are a slave to sin until... We have Jesus as our Lord and Savior in our heart. And then that box is destroyed. That chain is broken. And then we are free to live our life for him. How amazing is that? How wonderful is that to know that we don't have to be a slave to this sin anymore. That God is going to break that chain. The third thing is corruption to put off. You see, the way of life of the believer before he was a believer is to put off such is life is to characterize as conduct that was corrupt and crafty. This is the nature of sin. So as we have sin in our life, we want to be corrupt. We want to be crafty. We want to lie. We want to deceive others. That's the way of sin. And what we see is that these things in corrupt and destruction, they go hand in hand. What exactly does that mean? Well, that means that as, that as you are corrupt, destruction takes place in your life. So as you are following this sin, you are living your life more and more and more and more to death. Instead of life, that is through Jesus. So then, as we look, in verse 24, it then says this, and put on the new life, or put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. So the Greek word for put on is kainos, spelled K A I N O S, which makes you think that it's kainos, but it's kainos. I had to listen to that through Google about five times to remember. But kainos, which is different from the word renewed. And so what it's telling us in this specific passage, in this specific scripture, is to put on a merely renovated self. So we are no longer the same. We are to put on a new self. Take off the old self. And John, again, John Butler gives us three different things again whenever it comes to put on. And the first thing is the mind. What does that mean? It means the believer should think differently, have different perspectives, and a different thought life. The second is the man. This is another way of describing the different behavior believers should exhibit from the world. And the third is the manner. The old man was corrupt. The new man is completely different. It's a completely different person. Your manner is going to be different. The way you live your life is going to be different. The way you act is going to be different. Put on this newness. You see, this life exists because our identity is in Jesus. Our identity, y'all, is in Jesus. And so this manner of life is completely different. So here's what I'm going to ask. Take off your grave clothes and put on your new clothes. Live your life for God. Take off those old nasty garments, put them to the side, and live your life for the one true God. How do we live our life for the one true God? What do we do? What does that look like? Flip back over to Romans. And this time we're going to be at Romans chapter 6. Because it's very important for us to be able to take a look at Romans 6 and have an understanding of what exactly that means. What is this going to look like? How are we going to live our life for the one true God? Romans chapter 6, 
We're going to be looking specifically at verse 3. Romans 6, verse 3. So it tells us, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? So our entire sinful condition is taken up by Jesus through his death. Our entire sinful nature is taken up by trusting and believing in God and choosing to walk with him and saying, God, I'm going to give it all up. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to live my life for you. And then he's going to help guide us. But we can't just say, I'm going to live my life for you, and that's it. No, we have to continue to be digging in God's word, continue to be desiring to know more about who he is, desiring to live our life so much more for him and wanting to be as close as we possibly can so that we can hear his heartbeat in every decision we make. Don't we want to listen to his heart? Don't we want to do our best to live our life for him? Listen, we're a new creature We're a new creation through him. We should want to be as close as we can to him. It's kind of like whenever you take a look at your toddler or your baby. You are their advocate. You are the one that's going to take care of them. And as a parent, you desire to take care of that child. Listen, whenever you ask Jesus into your heart, he desires to take care of you. He desires to hold your hand, to help you walk, to help you learn to run and live your life for him. That's important. He truly, truly loves us. And then as we look in verse 4, we then see it says, We are buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, the glory of our Father, we too might walk in newness of life. You see, baptism is a symbol. And even though you can't see it, the baptismal is underneath these three trees over here. So if you've ever wondered where it's at, it's over here. My goal one day is to never have it covered. But what it's showing us is it's this newness. where it's, it's giving us this symbol of who we once were and how once we ask Christ into our life, there is this newness. And so we are buried with Christ in baptism. We are raised to walk in a new life. And that new life looks totally different than what our old life looked like. That new life looks totally different than who we once were, who we you know, thought we were going to be. And now it's all new. Is that not a beautiful picture or what? I think baptism is awesome. It's a beautiful symbol. Are we going to live our life for Christ and anew? What does this newness look, look like? What exactly does this mean? Well, I'm glad you asked. I have this right here. So imagine you go to your closet. And you pull out the old you. You pull out the old you. And so you try to put the old you on. This may take a couple of seconds, so bear with me, y'all. All right, here we go. Just warning you, sometimes I get major, you know, like, oh my gosh, whenever I start to feel stuck. So here we go. Here's the old you. I feel like I'm the Grinch whenever he's like, Psh, you know, okay. <laughs> Here's the old you. There's rips. There's words. Stains. It smells. It's the old you. Doesn't this look weird on? The old you doesn't match who you are through Christ. It's weird. It's uncomfortable. Why would we ever want to put the old you back on? Why would we ever want to 
look like this again. It's not right. God's better than this. So the old you should be put off. And you should put on the new you, which is through Jesus Christ, instead of looking like this. Now, again, it's going to be a struggle, so pardon me. Like, I literally am struggling right now. The old you should be taken off. It shouldn't be anymore the way it was. And it should be tossed aside to never be used again. Because whenever you wear that, it's like fitting a round peg in a square hole. It doesn't fit. It's not the same. It never will be the same. So throw it aside and say, no, thank you. Never again. Because I know the real answer. That's Jesus Christ. Because what happens is that is our new identity, not our old one. Because our old identity, is it kind of looks like this. You ready? What is it that we all like to do at the beginning of every year? January 1, we all say, I'm going to work out. I got my goals. I'm going to lose that weight. I'm not going to look like the Grinch when I put on an old T-shirt again. Okay? But we choose to work out. We choose to live our life for God. But here's the thing. As, an, as a person who doesn't believe in God, that becomes our identity. We work out in the morning. We work out in the evening. We focus on that at the expense of our family. And we choose to, you know, focus on all these things rather than what it is that's actually good for us, and, and which is, you know, God and our family and living our life for God. And we choose to just continue to, you know, focus on work out. Work out, work out, work out, work out. I got to get buff. I got to get fit. I got to lose that Grinch belly. But then with God, our identity is not working out. It's not, okay, I got to make sure I look this way. Our identity is God. Now, don't get me wrong. With God, we should still desire to have a healthy body, right? A healthy temple for God. We should still desire that. But our identity is not fitness. Our identity is not these things that we like to pile on ourselves. Our identity now is God. Where is your identity at? Is it in all these other things? Or is our identity in Jesus Christ? What are you choosing today? Because listen, when we have been given new life in Christ and we try to live the old way, we also experience a lot of frustration. Why? Because in Christ, we have a different shape to life. We have a new identity. And so today, if you have a new identity or if you want to have a new identity, if you want to have a new identity, I would ask that you come find Danny, Lane, myself, even Andy, the other person who was up here singing. And let's have a conversation. But listen, if you already have your identity in Christ, and you already said, I'm throwing my old off to the side and never again, then today is going to be a great day during this song for you guys to go to the sides and to just take this time in communion to remember that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. That Jesus died on the cross so that we can throw the old to the side. Take this time to say thank you God for what you've done for me. Thank you God for sending your son to die on the cross for my sins. 
toss the old and allow for there to be a new. Will you all pray with me?